Today we are talking about one of my all-time favourite games, Battlefleet Gothic. This isn't a lore video, I've already dealt with the core lore of Battlefleet Gothic in a previous video, you can check that out uh, in a link at the end if you want. Uh, no, today we are going to look at how do you play Battlefleet Gothic. So, okay, maybe you've, you've never come across Battlefleet Gothic before. Maybe you've come across it, but only as a video game. Maybe it's a game that came out after you got into the hobby, or maybe it's a game that came out so long ago you've forgotten how to play it. The purpose of today's video is to just cover the core rules for how this game of spaceship combat worked. Uh, Michael, if you're watching this, keep take note because we're going to be playing some battles in the new year and hopefully filming them uh, to be battle report videos which will appear on the channel in the new year. Uh, so, Battlefleet Gothic, as I say, a game of spaceship combat. It's a game where two players each build a fleet of various different spaceships from one of the core races that appeared uh, in the Battlefleet Gothic game. The first four core races that came were the Imperium, Chaos, Eldar and the Orcs. Tau, Tyranids and Necrons got a bit of a look in later on in some of the later editions. Uh, Space Marines as well got added to the Imperium as did the Mechanicum. I'm going to be looking at today an Imperial fleet as an example of how all the different rules work and I'm sorry Chaos and Eldar fleets you're going to be taking some of the brunt of the firepower. Uh, there are three classifications of ship that appeared in Battlefleet Gothic. So we need to deal with that first. They were escorts, which were the smallest grade of ship. They were little kind of one-hit ones that were coming kind of squadrons. I think of them, I suppose, like your squads. Cruisers, which were the main ships of the line. These could take a pounding and you'd have maybe three or four of these inside your, your, uh, your fleet to, to give it some backbone and some firepower. And the mighty battleships. Uh, these were the, uh, the juggernauts, the land raiders, really, of the uh, Battlefleet Gothic game. They were mighty weapon ships uh, with lots of hits and lots of firepower. You'd maybe only have one of these in your fleet, possibly two, depending on the size of game that you're playing. Uh, the game, as most Games Workshop games worked, was uh, turn-based. So one player would take a turn, they'd do all their moving and shooting and so forth. Then their opponent would get to take their turn to do all their moving and shooting and so forth. But there was a little bit of overlap. There were some things that would happen in each player's turn, regardless of whose turn it was. For example, things like torpedoes and stuff speeding through the void. They would continue moving in every player turn, both sides of the coin. The, the turn sequence then breaks down fairly simply. There was uh, a movement phase during which you would move your ships. And if you wanted to give your ships any special orders, telling them to perhaps move faster or turn quicker or lock on target, then you would do that then. Then there'd be the shooting phase where you would unleash your firepower upon your opponent's vessels. And uh, perhaps they might want to put uh, some kind of special order on one of their ships to brace for impact. Uh, to try and resist some of the incoming firepower that was flying their way. And then there'd be the ordnance phase, where, as I've said, torpedoes and fighter craft and stuff would go zooming around through the void, uh, and both players' selection of kind of micro stuff like torpedoes would get moved at that point. And finally, the end phase, where you'd try and repair damage that your vessel had uh, suffered, put out any fires that had been started, and remove some of, kind of the orbital debris that had been generated during the course of the combat. Uh, let's talk, first of all then, about orders, since I've mentioned them, and then we'll move on to showing you how the movement phase works. So, special orders, uh, there were six in total, and to help you with them, the game came with a selection of special dice. Uh, these are exactly the same dice, funnily enough, that came in the Epic 40,000 box set. You don't roll these dice, it's not a case of you going, ah, oh, what order do I get today? No, these were essentially counters. They were count six-sided counters that you could use to show different orders that had been placed on a vessel. Um, there were, as I say, six different orders. Uh, they were the all-ahead full order that would allow you to move your ship's extra distance at the expense of not being able to turn and reducing your firepower. The burn retros order that would allow you to hold your ship back and stop it from continuing its journey speeding across the void, possibly into the line of incoming fire from one of your opponent's vessels. Uh, there was the come to a new heading which let you make additional turn moves and we'll cover how turns work when we deal with the movement phase in a minute. Uh, there was the lock-on order. This gave you the opportunity to re-roll to hit when you were making your shooting attacks on your opponents, but again, at the expense of turning. And uh, the reload ordnance uh, order. This one was where perhaps you'd already launched a barrage of torpedoes into the void and you needed to yell down to the engineering decks to get them to reload fresh munitions into the, can in the chambers and lock the reload the tubes. 
Uh, I think this is partly because of uh, how effective torpedoes and other ordnance are in the game. It helps them balance them from becoming too overpowerful, uh, but also it just adds a little narrative element. Literally, the commander kind of bellowing down below decks and telling them to hurry up and get a move on, get that ordnance reloaded so they can fire it again. And finally, as I've already said, there was the Brace for Impact order, which happened during the shooting phase, which gave you a special save against any incoming fire. A four-up save, which is pretty good, because otherwise there were basically no saves in the game for the majority of vessels. Um, how do you make these orders happen then? Well, it's really simple. Each vessel has a leadership. That leadership isn't so much just representing how skilled the captain is, but it also takes into account how skilled the crew is, how well drilled they are, uh, any perhaps communications issues that the ship might be having. And leadership would be rolled for for each vessel or for each squadron of vessels at the start of the game and then you'd note it down on each of the ship's kind of uh, bit of paper or an index card so that you could keep track of uh, what the leadership was for each vessel and then after that it's just a straight up 2d6 leadership test like many people have come across in various editions of the games workshop game roll your leadership or less on two dice if you succeed great if you fail sorry that order doesn't take effect and because of the communication issues it causes, no further orders can be issued that turn. A bit of a risk, really, when you think about it in those terms. Helped, therefore, for you to have to think about which ships were more likely to pass their leadership tests and maybe make those leadership tests and put those orders on first. But also you'd have to balance it against which orders do I desperately need? Is it vital that I get a lock on order on this uh, ship at this moment in time? Or is it vital that I make sure this ship turns away before it crashes into that planetoid over there? These were the kind of the decisions you had to make at the very start of your turn, even before you began doing anything else. Once you've made those decisions, then you'd move on to movement. So, movement. Uh, in a bit of a change from the rules for other Games Workshop games, movement wasn't done in Imperial. I'm sorry, Imperial Fleet. It was done in Metric. Yes, Battlefleet Gothic was a Metric game, much like Epic 40,000, the uber small scale version. We're going to go from the, the mega scale here of uh, fleet battles to the tiny scale of Epic 40,000. Perhaps I'll talk about it in a future video. Each ship had a movement characteristic uh, that was set out in centimeters. So for example, I'm going to deal with here, I'll just move these ships to one side. Uh, I'm going to deal with here uh, a Mars class battle cruiser. So this is a mighty imperial ship uh, which has a 20 centimeter move. Movement is measured from the stem of the flying stand. So although we've got this really cool funky model, to factor in the fact that the scale of spaceship combat, because the thing about space is, it's really, really, really big, as Holly would have us believe. And so, although the models are these huge, cool uh, miniatures, the measurement is all taken from the stand, from the stem of the uh, model. So, for example, shooting this vessel to another shirt vessel, I know I'm getting ahead of myself, but I would measure from the stem of this base to the stem of that base, rather than measuring from gun barrel to hull, for example. But likewise, movement is done from the stem of the model's base, and that's where the model's movement ends. 20 centimeters we go, eee, there we go. Um, core rules that need to be considered as part of your movement phase is you have to move unless you've used the burn retros order. Vessels have to move at least half of their movement each turn because once you've got momentum going in space unless you take action to arrest it again it's fairly hard to bring it to a stop but also vessels had a limited amount of turning circle the bigger the vessel the smaller the turning circle this mars class battle cruiser for example only had a 45 degree turning circle that meant that each turn it could only turn 45 degrees unless it had used the come to a new heading order which would let it make a second turn it also had to move at least half its movement before it made any turn. So it had to move at least 10 centimetres before it could make a 45 degree turn, and then it could move up to another 10 centimetres. This therefore meant that vessels that were more nimble, like escorts that had a 90 degree turning circle, could, if they were uh, careful, run rings around the bigger, slower, more lumbering vessels. Albeit, if they got their, their nimble manoeuvres wrong, then they were likely to get destroyed by a broadside from the uh, larger, slower vessel. Um, like I said, the other order you can use in the movement phase, the all ahead full, this gave vessels uh, an extra 46 inch movement, but the expense that because every engine was being fired to push the vessel further forward, it couldn't make any turns. It had to move its full movement and it had to move an extra 46 inches. So it couldn't, for example, choose to lose less than that. It had to blitz the full movement forward. Um, okay. 
that's the core orders then, that's the core movement rules. Let's look at uh, perhaps everyone's favourite part of, of spaceship combat, the shooting phase. There are a number of core types of weapons that featured in Battlefleet Gothic, but they can be broken down really to this. Direct fire weapons, so this is weapons batteries, this is mass mega cannons, this is um, huge, you know, bolter firing things or, you know, things that chuck ordnance shells the size of city blocks at the opponent. Uh, these used a very, very similar chart to the firepower chart from Epic 40,000. This is the Battlefleet Gothic chart. It was dependent, though, upon where the enemy vessel was in relation to your fire arc. So, for example, vessels have, as I've just said, a fire arc. Uh, they often have a weapon notation, as you can see again here for the Mars-class battlecruiser, that shows whether a weapon can fire to the front, whether it can fire to the port side or the starboard side. For those who are confused, port is the left as you're facing towards the front of the ship. Well, starboard is the right as you are facing towards the front of the ship. Um, yeah, weapons had a particular fire arc. They could only fire within a 45-degree arc of the uh, fire arc, and the box set came with a handy-dandy little compass to help you determine whether something was in which fire arc. But also, vessels were easier to hit if they were moving towards you. So let's take an example here of this, this Mars-class battlecruiser. Say it's drifting along through space. It's got a nice big uh, array of guns down its uh, starboard side. And this Styx-class Chaos Heavy Cruiser is coming daggering in towards it. This vessel is therefore classed as closing with the Mars-class vessel, whereas the Mars-class vessel is a beam of the Styx-class vessel. As you might guess, um, the third and final option is if you're not side on from it and you're not heading straight on towards it, then the third and final option is moving away. So, for example, this vessel is moving away from the Styx-class carrier. Um, where the vessel is in relation to the firing vessel determines which column you use on the firepower chart, and you cross-reference the firepower value, the total firepower value of all weapons that are going to be firing at the target against the firepower chart and work out how many dice you get to roll. So let's play through this little example. Here we are, we've got this uh, Mars-class battlecruiser. There's a Styx coming towards it. Uh, therefore, the Styx vessel is closing. It's in range of its uh, starboard side weapons battery, which, as we can see here, has a firepower value of six. So we look at the chart, a vessel which is a capital ship, which a cruiser counts as, it's not an escort. So cruisers and battleships count as capital ships. A capital ship which is closing, cross-reference firepower six, and I'd get four dice. Four dice for this Mars-class battlecruiser to unload on the sticks. If the sticks was further away, so if it was more than 30 centimetres away from the uh, Mars-class battlecruiser, then I would have to move one column to the right, which would only give me three dice to shoot at it. If, on the other hand, as this one is, I'm within 15 centimetres of the target. Yep, uh, measuring stem to stem, actually. No, I'm just out of 15 centimetres. Okay, well, let's just move you a little further forward. <laughs> if I was within 15 centimetres of the target, then I get to move one column shift to the left, which would give me five dice to shoot at this Sticks. Sorry, Mr. Sticks. Let's then roll and see whether or not I hit anything. So... The uh, Mars class battlecruiser unloading on the sticks, five dice. What do I need to hit? I need its armor value. Most vessels have an armor value of, uh, for example, five. The Imperium ships have five, except on the front where their heavily armored prows have an armor value of six. Eldar vessels have an armor value of four because they're made of Baco foil. And Orc vessels basically put six armor on the front, and five on the sides, and four on the rear engines, which are liable to explode at any moment. But each vessel will therefore very clearly indicate what its armour value is, and that's what your opponent needs to roll to hit. Away we go! Woo! Okay, so, two hits on the Styx class battlecruiser. That could mean two points of damage to the Styx. However, the Styx has shields. Most vessels have power fields. Eldar are different, and we'll talk about them perhaps another time. Uh, vessels like Little Escorts perhaps only have one power field. The Styx class heavy battlecruiser, I believe, has three. Let's just do a quick check. Two shields, so it has two shields. So those two hits have successfully hit the shields of the Styx class battlecruiser, but they don't make it through to the hull. However, they do strip down those two shields. And to represent this, we put blast markers on it. So I've got two little blast markers here. Stick those on the Styx, and you put it in the part of the Styx's base that is facing the target 
that just fired at it. Uh, the Mars class battlecruiser is not done though. It's got some other weapons. Uh, it has a dorsal lance battery and this can fire to the front, the left or the right. Um, lances are the next kind of weapon fire. So we've talked about weapons batteries and we have this really nice kind of cool chart that helps us determine how many shots we get. Lances are the next type of weapon you can fire though. And these are literally ginormous laser beams. I mean, these are like you know, the sort of things that would, you would annihilate a Warlord Titan in a single shot if it was fired from orbit. This is when we talk about orbital lance strikes in 40k. These are the weapons we are talking about. The Mars has two shots with its orbital lances, with its lances. These are these nifty little turrets up on the top here. And lances will always hit a target on a four up, regardless of the armor value. So it doesn't matter the sticks has got a five up armor. I've got lances, those two shots hitting on fours. If I had fired it before I'd fired the weapons battery, then those lances would likely have stripped away the target's shields. But I would then therefore have had uh, the fire the weapons battery through the blast markers. Firing through blast markers with a weapons battery gives you a column shift to the right. Firing lances does not. So tactically, it makes more sense to fire your weapons battery first, try and strip off your opponent's shields if possible, or fire one other vessel perhaps to strip off their shields, like an escort, for example, to strip off the shields, and then fire lances, confident in the fact that the opposing vessel has no shields left to protect it, and you can just try and peel away its hull armour. That being said, let's give it a go. A five and a one. Okay, so that would be a hit on the Mars class, uh, on the sticks. So instantly, that's a layer of its eight hit points stripped away. The other thing that you do when you cause physical damage to one of your opponent's ships is you roll to see whether or not you've successfully caused a critical hit. Doesn't count when you're rolling on shields, but any hits that strip away hull points from the vessel, you roll a d6 for each hit, so 1d6 in this case, and on a roll of a 6, something catastrophic has happened, something critical. Okay, so that's a 6. So what I would then do is I would roll on the critical hits chart. And this is a 2d6 chart. Something else could happen to this vessel. So let's roll and see what we get. A 12! Oh my god! Okay, that was unexpected. Um, a 12 is the worst thing that can happen to a vessel. It's bulkheads collapsing. This instantly causes another d6 hits on the vessel. Six! So this six has gone from being absolutely fine to having its shield stripped off, a critical hit on its hull, and it's bored straight through the superstructure and caused, in total now, seven points of its eight points of damage. So it's gone from being absolutely fine to having one hit point left. A vessel that is damaged like this is called crippled. Uh, a vessel that is crippled then halves the firepower of its weapons batteries, it halves the effectiveness of its defensive turrets, it halves the number of shields it's got. So even if the Styx extricates itself from this situation, it's only going to have one shield as it limps out of there from here on. And also, crucially, it reduces their movement rate by five centimetres. So it's gone from having a 25 centimetre move to a slower 20 centimetre move. Uh, but there's a couple more types of weapons that we just need to quickly cover. We've covered direct fire weapons like uh, weapons batteries. We've covered lances. There is one other special weapon that this vessel is equipped with, and that's known as the Nova Cannon. Technically, I should have fired the Nova Cannon first, but I wouldn't want to throw us straight on the deep end. Nova Cannons are basically where so what happens when someone goes, what would happen if I strapped a nuclear bomb to a railgun and lobbed it through space? Nova Cannons are a guess range weapon, so you have to guess at least 30 centimetres. You can't fire it at anything closer than 30 centimetres. But let's move this Mars Battlecruiser way over here behind this squadron and say I'm going to guess uh, 38 centimetres from the back that the Mars class battle cruiser. So I measure from its stem, as we said before, 38 centimeters places a, the Nova Cannon template right here, just in front of the stick. So it hasn't quite hit it, but you place the compass, which niftily doubles as a blast marker, on the other side of this. And because the base of part of the, of the blast template touches the base of the stick's class vessel, that vessel instantly takes a hit. If I had man, it ignores shields, it just goes wham, straight through, because it's the force of the explosion, I guess. Um, if I had guessed a couple of centimetres further and managed to get the hole anywhere over the base of the sticks, it would have taken D6 hits instead, which frankly would have just destroyed it. As it is, though, it's taken a hit. That reduces it to zero hits. First, we find out that's a critical hit. This one is not a critical hit. But we now have to roll for the damage it's coming. It suffers 
catastrophic damage. And this is, again, a 2d6 chart to see what happens to the sticks. I'm not making this up. Another 12. This is, again, the worst thing that could possibly happen to this vessel. Its warp drive implodes. Uh, and then explodes, essentially temporarily tearing a warp rift in space. There are much less destructive options. I mean, the most common one for basically half of the dice rolls is that the vessel just turns into a drifting hulk and drifts across the battlefield completely, you know, just getting in the way and otherwise blocking lines of fire, but completely out of control. In this case, though, instead what happens is I roll 3d6. So that is 6, 9, 11, and everything within 11 centimetres takes 8 hits, and they're equal to the starting damage of the vessel, worth of hits. Uh, in this case, that's going to be... Ooh, just out. Nothing, nothing else, thankfully, is in range. So there was just very temporarily a warp rift here in space that rips the, the galaxy asunder, and the sticks is gone. Um... Those are the core weapons that you're dealing with in this game. You're dealing with weapons batteries, you're dealing with um, lance weapons, and you're dealing with the Nova Cannon. There are some other weapons that come into effect for things like other races, like the Eldar or the Space Marines, who have giant bombardment cannons that they normally use for destroying planets and carrying out exterminatus. And there's some really kind of kooky stuff, like a Death Star-type vessel called the Planet Killer, that fires the Nova Cannon as just a giant beam that moves across the board, hitting anything that it passes over. Yeah, madness. Um, once every vessel has had its chance to fire, though, uh, then what we would move on to is the ordnance phase. The ordnance phase, then, is where vessels ha have uh, launch bays, like this little sticks here, uh, can launch some ordnance, and uh, weapons that, vessels that have torpedo tubes, uh, like the... Uh, ah. <laughs> Dictator class cruiser that I've just broken the stab on there for a moment uh, can launch torpedo volleys. In order to do this, you should actually put the counters for the things the ordnance that you're going to launch in base contact with the vessel that is launching them in the shooting phase, but they won't do anything until you reach the ordnance phase. So here, for example, uh, the Star Hammer, this Dictator class cruiser, has a firepower uh, strength six torpedo salvo. So I'll put a strength six torpedo salvo in base to base contact with the Star Hammer. In the ordnance phase, then, those torpedoes move. And again, the movement rate of the torpedoes is covered on the data sheet for each vessel. I'll quickly check. But the movement for a Dictator-class cruiser's torpedoes, which I think is the same for all uh, Imperial torpedoes, uh, is 30 centimetres. So what would happen is these torpedoes now move in a straight line, and you can only move in a straight line, 30 centimetres straight forward. And as luck would have it, because of where I positioned it, it strikes the sticks. What I would now do, therefore, is make a number of to-hit rolls against the sticks based upon the strength of the torpedoes. Because it's a strength 6 torpedo salvo, in theory I would be rolling 6 dice. However, the sticks has, as I mentioned previously, defensive turrets. Before the Mars-class battlecruiser crippled it and reduced the number of turrets it had by half, it had two turrets. Let's pretend it's undamaged for the moment. Turrets are essentially a chance to reduce the strength of incoming ordnance. Uh, on a 4-up, I can shoot down two of the torpedoes, reducing the strength of this salvo by two, so that there are only four torpedoes potentially going to hit me. I need a four, five, or six, though, to hit the torpedoes. I get a four and a six, so that torpedo salvo drops in strength to strength four, and only four torpedoes hit the six. That's still not good news for the sticks, though, because torpedoes and other ordnance ignore shields. These move at a sufficient speed that the shields don't stop them. They can slip straight through them and hit directly into the sticks' hull. What I roll now is I roll four dice for the strength four torpedo salvo, and any that come up a five or a six, the armor value of the sticks, cause a hit. Ooh, two fives. Two hits on the sticks, then. So that would be two points of damage, and exactly as we did in the shooting phase, we would roll to see if those were critical hits. And there's a six! Oh no, again, it's not looking good for the Chaos Fleet. Roll 2d6 on the critical hit chart. A six. Okay, this is much less destructive than the bulkhead collapse. A six still does an extra point of damage. So that torpedo has hit the engine room. It's damaged the engine room. Uh, therefore, the six takes an additional point of damage. So it's now taken three points of damage from this torpedo salvo. And it can't make any turns until it has repaired that damage in the end phase. What also happens is the rest of the torpedoes that didn't successfully strike the ship's hull keep going. So two torpedoes hit. I take away two, therefore. That still leaves two in the strength of the salvo. I measure 30 centimetres from the original firing ship, or from where the torpedoes started from at the start of this turn. And actually, those two torpedoes end up somewhere over there. 
which could be very bad news if, for example, I had an escort squadron loitering over there. Because in theory, those torpedoes, if I don't move quick enough, and it's not my turn next, it'd be the Chaos turn next, in the Chaos turn ordnance phase, those torpedoes keep moving and will strike that Imperial Escort. So you've got to have an awareness of what's downrange or how far downrange you are when you're positioning your fleet. You've kind of got to think, not in three dimensions as such, but think about where everything's going to be in a couple of turns' time when you're planning your movement, which is one of the things I love about Battlefleet Gothic. As I said, there are other kinds of ordnance. This includes different kinds of torpedoes, like boarding torpedoes that are chock-a-block full of, in, uh, sort of crewmen waiting to stage a boarding action on an enemy vessel. The benefit of things like boarding torpedoes is they can actually make turns. So say this was a boarding torpedo salvo that had gone past the sticks. Next turn I can go, okay, this torpedo salvo is going to make a 45 degree turn and veer and go behind the escort rather than risk smashing into it. The other thing though is that boarding torpedoes don't roll directly on the armour value of the ship. Instead, they roll a, a d6 and see whether or not they cause a critical hit on the enemy vessel and what kind of damage the boarders cause. They can only cause up to a six, they can only cause up to engine room damage, but it can still be fairly vital in terms of disabling weapons, uh, reducing the speed or turning circle of a ship, and making it easier prey if you're on the vessel. So when you fire a torpedo salvo or when you reload a torpedo salvo, which this ship would now have to do in its next turn before it could fire again, you have to think about what kind of torpedoes you want to load. And there were also, in, in other issues of White Dwarf, they introduced all kinds of cool other torpedo types. Uh, the, the other kind of ordnance then that vessels can have is fighter craft. Uh, that comes in two kinds, fighters and where are you? Bombers. Fighters are great for protecting your ship from ordnance. So fighters can intercept enemy fighters or enemy bombers. They can intercept torpedoes. They can zoom around the place, moving however you want uh, and trying to protect the mother carrier, essentially. Bombers on the other hand are your attack vessels. Uh, this ship's got two launch bays on each side, so it can launch two squadrons from each side. Uh, I'm going to say that this vessel, because I know that Styx is chock-a-block full of uh, enemy bombers, it's going to launch a wave of two fighters from one side and a fighter and bomber wave from the other. The other the wave of fighters are there to protect the, uh, the bombers. What I could do is I could combine them all into one giant wave of four if I wanted. That's what I'm going to choose to do here. Turrets can fire uh, multiple times depending on the number of times they can attack. They have to choose whether they're going to fire at torpedoes or whether they're going to fire at attack craft. In this case, for example, I could say quite comfortably now, this vessel fired at the torpedoes, so it's not going to fire on my attack craft. But let's say for the sake of argument that I hadn't fired torpedoes that turn, then uh, it would be to my benefit to send these in as a single wave, because I'm only going to get two turret shots at all four bases of attack craft, versus sending them in two waves where the turrets could choose to fire at the two each sets of two essentially. I could fire the two turrets at the two attack craft and the two turrets again at the next two attack craft. I'm going to send these in as a single wave therefore to reduce the amount of harm that's being uh, unleashed upon them and try and improve the odds of my getting my bombers through to attack the ship's hull. Um, what I'm going to do as well as I've combined these as a wave of fighters and bombers, and you can do that. You can choose how many uh, fighters you put out, how many bombers you put out. If you've equipped your ship with it, which some of the capital ships, like this, this Space Marine Battle Barge here, you can equip them with assault boats as well, which can carry out, again, boarding actions on enemy vessels. I'm here to send fighters and bombers, a wave of three fighters, four, uh, one wave of bombers over there. Uh, they move at the speed, therefore, of the slowest attack craft, which in this case is the bombers. Bombers have a move of only 20 centimetres compared to the 30 centimetre move of the fighters. Should still be more than enough though, going from the base of this vessel. 20 centimetres conveniently puts them in contact with the sticks. And so the sticks again opens fire with its turrets. Two turrets, four bases. A four and a six, so it takes out two of the incoming wave. I can choose to take those off as the two fighters though. I can choose what I take off. Fighters can't harm a capital ship, but they've done an admiral job of guiding the bombers in. This base of fighters therefore does nothing. It makes contact with that base, uh, that ship, and then is removed. But the bombers, this wave of bombers get to make an attack, and they get to make a D6 attacks against that vessel. So it's the equivalent of hitting that vessel D6 times. Uh, okay, so let's roll to see how many hits the bombers get. Two. Uh, I'm going to pretend I didn't roll the two because I want to demonstrate how it works. Uh, let's see. The bombers got... Stop rolling twos. Let's say the bombers have got five hits, so uh, they get five minus two, that's three attacks on the vessel. I get to roll three attacks against its armour value then. Uh, and yeah, woohoo, one of those goes through. So that's now brought it down to being crippled. And 
what we importantly do is we want to see if it's another critical. No, that one's not a critical. Um, that's the ordnance phase. The final phase then would be the end phase. Now, uh, I've not damaged my own vessels, so I can't roll to see whether or not they can repair any damage. But in each phase, uh, each end phase, both players get to roll to see if they can repair any criticals. So this one suffered damage to its engine room. I can roll a number of dice equal to the number of damage points I've got remaining. So I've got four damage points left remaining, so I can roll four dice. Any of these come up a six, I can repair my engines. Yeah, that's a six. So the six at least has got its engine back under control and can make turns again. It doesn't have to keep blitzing forward across the board. Uh, once that's all completed, the other thing that happens is the player whose turn it is rolls a dice and removes that many blast markers. Say there have been some blast markers here, I'd remove one and that. Uh, you have to remove a blast marker. I might not want to, I might want to go, no, I want to leave blast markers scattered in front of this vessel to make it more difficult for it because it's slowed by moving through blast markers. I have to remove a number of blast markers equal to whatever I roll. There's no choice in that. That is just to represent uh, the general disbursement into the cosmos of radiation, debris, and other you know, detritus that have been caused by the, the mass of uh, spaceship combat. Those are the core rules, then. There's just a couple of other little rules I want to touch on before we finish this video. Um, firstly, as I've said, vessels can form squadrons. The benefit of that is that they can move as one and make a single leadership test for the whole fleet. So a, a group of escorts, you could do it with escorts, but you could do it with cruisers. I could say these two vessels are going to form a squadron. I only have to make one leadership test to put a special order on both vessels, which, if one vessel's got a better leadership than the other, is great. If one vessel, for example, has got my, my flagship with my commander on it with a really cool leadership, even better. But as long as they remain within 15 centimetres of each other, they don't have to keep facing the same way. They can keep going, you know, wherever they want. As long as they remain within 15 centimetres of each other, those vessels continue to move and operate as a squadron. And, crucially, they can combine firepower. So these two vessels, who perhaps have firepower 6 each on their starboard side, could unleash a firepower 12 salvo on the sticks over here. Likewise, this group of uh, Imperial Escorts, on their own, a little bit measly, only firepower 4, but grouped together, they three Escorts suddenly become a firepower 12, equivalent to putting out the firepower of both cruisers. Um, likewise, torpedo boats, a little bit different. They, have, they can't... They can be a squadron and fire their firepower weapons if they remain within 15 centimetres centimetre of each other. But if they remain in base-to-base -base contact with each other, then they can combine their torpedo salvos. So this little group of Cobras, which have a two torpedoes each, uh, would otherwise be putting out little pew pew torpedo salvos that would each time the turrets on the enemy vessel would get to try and shoot those down, can instead, by being in base contact with each other, crank out a firepower six torpedo salvo that blitzes through space and stands a much better chance of getting past the enemy turrets. The other thing that I think is worthy of mention is boarding actions. If a vessel comes into base contact, not the ships themselves touching, but the base is touching like this, then they can, for they can lock holes together grav lines kind of get cast and tractor beams fasten the two vessels together and they can then launch a boarding action a boarding action is quite convoluted and i'm not going to explain it in too great a detail but essentially it's a case of both players rolling dice and adding a number of modifiers and whoever has the higher dice score wins and inflicts that many hits the difference between the two scores hits on the opposing vessel and then both vessels make a dice roll to see whether or not they can cause a critical hit on the other and they remain locked together like that until such time as one vessel is destroyed and the grav line seven and then it becomes a drifting hulk and drifts away it doesn't have to roll on the catastrophic damage chart it just drifts off on fire uh, whilst the surviving vessel lives to fight another day as you might imagine orcs love boarding actions the other thing orcs love is the final thing i want to talk about and that is Running speed! Yes, it wouldn't be a game of ship combat if there wasn't the option to smash into each other. It's one of the reasons why Imperium vessels have these heavily armoured prows and big spikes on the front, and it's one of the reasons why the Orcs developed a type of vessel that is basically just an anvil with an engine on the back. If you so wish, you may issue the All Ahead Full order and uh, launch... Do the, uh, all Ahead Full... Launch a ramming attack on your opponent. You have to pass the leadership test for all ahead full, but if you succeed, you roll your four dice. Woohoo! That plus my movement brings me smashing into contact with the enemy vessel. What I then do is I roll a number of dice equal to my current hits against the armor value of my opponent. So here I've got, say I've got full hits left. I'd roll eight dice hitting on fives to smash through the side armor of this Styx class cruiser. Uh, and that would be one, two, three, four hits. 
crashing damage into the side of it. All of which could, in theory, they didn't, but they could be critical hits. I do, however, run the risk of taking damage back in return. Let's say this Styx is undamaged. I myself would then sustain, potentially, half the uh, starting damage value, or half the current damage value of the enemy vessel against my front armour. Uh, that's the point, of course, it's the front armour that's crashing into it. Uh, I am therefore facing four dice, which my opponent would roll. If any of these are a six... No, they're not! No damage for the Mars! It just smashes into the Styx, crippling and bending the superstructure around it as it does so. Um, the Styx is then free to move away from me next turn, limp away from me. Uh, likewise, I'm free then to continue moving beyond it next turn, having presumably grazed through and smashed through part of its hull and carried on on my merry way. Um, it is obviously much better and much more useful to crash a more heavily armoured and uh, ship with lots of hit points like a cruiser into another enemy vessel than it is for example to crash an escort but that's nothing to say you can't do it and even an escort can still give it a go but here this little sword is rolling one dice then against the sticks does nothing the sticks rolls four dice back and yeah it would destroy the sword the sword just smashes itself against the enemy hull this is one thing I just want to mention about the orcs that the orcs have the advantage orc have a type of escort called a Brute Ram Ship. As I described, it's basically a fist of metal with a jet engine on the back. Brute Ram Ships always roll four dice. Even though they've only got one hit, they roll four dice when ramming an enemy to represent the fact that they are just a giant chunk of adamantium thrusting into the enemy. I have heard tell of Orc players who have just taken fleets of nothing but Brute Ram Ships. I think that's taking it a bit far for me, taking nothing but a selection of Brute Ram Ships, although it does sound incredibly orky. Um, but yeah, those are the core rules. There are some other additional rules that come along the side, things like letting you do teleport attacks by coming within range and teleporting a boarding action on your opponent. And like I said, there's uh, convoluted things about hit and run attacks and stuff with attack boats swooping down the side of the vessels. Eldar have a completely different set of rules to everybody else in terms of how they move and fight and shoot and everything. But that is, in a nutshell, how Bot Battlefleet Gothic is played. Uh, what I might do is do another video in the future, dealing with some of the more esoteric rules, things like uh, celestial phenomena. I need to build some celestial phenomena if Michael and I are going to have some battles in the new year. Uh, so I think I'll have to build myself some planets, some moons, and some asteroid fields. And maybe when I'm doing that, I'll film myself talking a little bit more about how those different rules interact with the game. I hope you enjoyed this little kind of just whistle-stop tour through the rules of Battlefleet Gothic. I hope it's been instructive to you. Uh, please let me know in the comments below about your favourite fleet for Battlefleet Gothic or all awesome moments from Battlefleet Gothic that you have enjoyed. I'm off now, though, to uh, yell ramming speed some more, and I will catch you next time. Thank you very much for watching, and bye for now.